Well, John, today's vlog is going to be a little bit of a sad one. Woke up today and got some pretty sad news. Yep. Well, it's a sad day here at what used to be my home away from home. I literally used to spend, when I wasn't working, just about every spare moment hanging out at this place, and it's all thanks to Miss Mitzi Shore. In 1972, Mitzi and her husband Sammy and their partner Rudy opened the comedy store right here. Now her husband Sammy, Sammy Shore, was an established comedian that was pretty popular in the Vegas circuit and had actually in the late 60s been the opening act uh, for Elvis Presley on quite a few of his uh, engagements in Las Vegas. And it wasn't until uh, the Colonel decided that Elvis didn't need an opening act anymore that all of a sudden Sammy found himself out of a Vegas gig. He and his wife Mitzi already lived in Los Angeles here in Beverly Hills and this was the former site of Ciro's. Now what happened was at the time this half of Ciro's was closed down. Nobody was using it but the other side over here, I'll show you, was uh, was being used by the Art LeBeau Theater and they would do a, uh, a weekly broadcast from here, right over here. So in 1972, nobody was using the other half of this building and there were no comedy clubs in Los Angeles. So Sammy, his partner Rudy, and Mitzi didn't even have a name for this place and started doing comedy here on a nightly basis. Now you can tell with the, uh, the passing of Mitzi today that it's pretty hopping out here. But basically what happened was when they opened their doors here, they had no admission price. You basically paid 90 cents or 85 cents for a drink and the comedy was free. Now, they actually had, it, it was a policy of open mic. So since comedy was pretty much new as far as stand-up comedy in the Los Angeles area, um, both Sandy and his, or Sammy and his partner would both perform here nightly, and then anybody that just showed up off the street that wanted to perform could come in here and perform. Now, that was kind of a reckless way to do it at the time, if you think about it, because you never know who was gonna show up, and in some cases, they even said they would start a show and they would say, don't leave, folks, people will eventually show up, comics will eventually show up, and so what ended up happening was, this was kind of a ragtag operation that wasn't really a business yet, so, Sammy got asked to uh, to go do a six-week Vegas gig at I believe it was the Hilton and uh, So Mitzi decided to come and run the place while while he was gone while he was um, off doing his gig in Vegas Now Mitzi instilled order here and what Mitzi did was she was here night after night morning till night and she would uh, she started decorating the place, started painting the walls. I mean, this was kind of a dilapidated place when she first started running it. And what she would do is she would watch the comics and she decided this wasn't a comedy club, um, like a nightclub. It wasn't something that was here to make money. What she wanted it to be was she wanted it to be a place that people could come, comics could come and work out like a gym. You came here to get better. It wasn't about the money. And so she would observe comedians and based on your performance and how well you were doing uh, night after night that's what would determine where you would perform in the lineups and sometimes where you were put on the lineup would determine your success in your career she would also determine um, how often you would get to perform how many nights and early on <coughs> when she first started doing this for some reason the crowd just wouldn't take to women so Mitzi used what used to be in Ciro's called the belly room right here and it's actually this room right up there that was called the belly room at Ciro's because at the time um, they would have belly dancers up there and there's actually a picture of Frank Sinatra sitting at a table right here, right against that wall on the inside. Now she would, um, since for some reason that would be like a lull in the show when, when women would perform, she decided to kind of segregate it a little bit and have all the women perform up in the, up in the belly room. 
and some comedians didn't like it, but in the long run it turned out to be great because they developed a following of people that would go up there and just watch them. Now, originally, of course, like nobody was up there because nobody wanted to sit in like a small little room and watch comedy where you could hear like the big room of all the laughter and everything downstairs. So, like I said at the time though, this was the only comedy club in town. It wasn't until, I believe it was 1976 when Bud Friedman decided to open an improv out here and that was like her first competition. Now even then, she viewed the comedy store as such a special place that if you wanted to be a comedy store comic, she wouldn't allow you to be on the marquee at the improv or anywhere else. Now to tell you how influential she was, the man who started the Laugh Factory, Jamie Masada, started answering phones here. Now every name that you see on the walls here, these were not people who had established careers for the most part. Now Richard Pryor did, but when all the names on these walls were people that showed up here as new comics, unestablished comics, Mitzi saw something in them. Now there, I know a lot of people that perform here and the legend is it was not uncommon for Mitzi to watch literally one sentence of a comedian's act and say, give him the light, he's done, he's out of here. She could just tell right away whether you had it or not. And if she thought you had it, she would offer them a job. Because if you had a job here, either parking cars or, um, or uh, work in the door, then that guaranteed you more spots and more opportunities to work out. And that's how people like Jay Leno, David Letterman, um, you can even see Steve Martin's up here, Billy Crystal, Andy Kaufman. A lot of the people got their start here. Bob Saget was a host here. Sam Kinison got his start here. He's had, I mean, we've had people like Chris Rock. I mean, every big name in comedy, for the most part, started here because of Mitzi Shore. And that was literally just like two or three days ago that the Comedy Store celebrated its 46th anniversary here. And it's pretty cool because, like I said, it originally started as just this room, what's called the original room and the back belly room. But out of nowhere in, uh, in 1976, Mitzi went and bought the entire building out from underneath everybody. Didn't tell anybody it was happening and then immediately took over what's now the main room, started doing main room shows in there and was trying to attract, uh, basically her idea was to bring Vegas comedy um, to that room while keeping this original room right here on the other side of that glass. Literally the stage is on the other side of that glass. Her idea was to keep that as a workout space for young and upcoming comedians, but to give established people like, you know, Richard Pryor, Red Fox, people like that, a, uh, a more established place to play, but she ran into a problem because in those days, those people all made their money in Vegas. And when she would ask them to play, they would say, I can't, nobody's gonna come see me in Vegas if they can come see me in Los Angeles, it'll hurt my draw. So originally this was not a real successful venture until uh, I believe it was Richard Pryor agreed to play here. And Richard Pryor would end up uh, being the person that would really kind of turn you know, a place that was pretty packed into a place that would have 700 people lining this street waiting to get in every night. And this couldn't be more appropriate because Mitzi Shore wasn't just the talent coordinator here or even just the person that named this place. She was the heart and soul here. In fact, from the earliest days of Sammy doing comedy, people would say that she would be backstage mentoring the uh, younger comedians, almost being like the den mother to them. And when Sammy would end up uh, opening for Elvis for those years, even Elvis loved Mitzi and would strike up a great rapport with her. Now unfortunately, the last couple of years Mitzi had been suffering from, I believe, um, dementia and we found out today that unfortunately the great Mitzi Shore has passed, but her legacy will live on in the comedy store because like I said, this was her house. And what I mean by that is eventually when her marriage didn't work out and there was nothing left between her and Sammy and they got a divorce, she made a deal with Sammy. Uh, he was supposed to pay $1,100 a month in child support. She made a deal that she would take 600 and she wanted the comedy store. So literally this, this is her house. This, 
this will always be her house. And she was so supportive of comedians that throughout her life here, anybody that she saw that had an ability or a talent, she would make them a part of the family. She would loan them the comedy store van to run errands. She would, uh, she owned, when she bought the club, it came with a house right above here called, that they nicknamed Crest Hill. And that became a house that she would let comedians live in. She would give them food, uh, she would pay them. She would co-sign for cars because she was their employer. <laughs> You know, she knew that um, she would co-sign for their cars because she knew, well, hey, if, uh, you know, if I co-sign for their cars, then I know they'll be getting, I, I'm agreeing that they're going to be getting spots and, you know, that was, that was her way of helping them. At one point, the house above here, Crest Hill, Mark Marin, um, Andrew Dice Clay, Sam Kinison, they all live there together, Yakov Smirnoff. Like I said, every name here on this wall owes her a debt of gratitude because there is no comedy club in the world quite like this place. She made it okay to do anything in the name of comedy. Whereas, you know, you would hear about just things happening where, um, you know, people get in trouble in different comedy clubs. She made that part of the deal. She said, hey, I'm not gonna make a comedian feel um, uncomfortable trying out bits. They shouldn't feel um, that they're going to be scrutinized for trying something. Now she also gave Howie Mandel a career. She put Robin Williams on here, Jim Carrey. I mean, the, the list is literally endless of people that owe her something. You can see, I mean, <laughs> Dom Herrera, Joe Rogan, Joey Diaz, Burt Kreischer. And there were people that she flat out never ever passed and never ever let become a member of this store. Like uh, Cat Williams, he used to perform under the name Cat in the Hat. She said he's not funny, wouldn't put him up here. And in fact, when, uh, when the Comedy Store posted a uh, 46th anniversary photo just two or three days ago, one of the comments I read on there was actually from George Lopez. And George Lopez's comment was very, very reminiscent of a lot of comedians' stories about Mitzi. He said, I came to the Comedy Store in 1982. Mitzi told me, go perform in Mission Hills. He said she was right. She had this weird gift of telling people what it was that would make their career. Maybe the comedy store wasn't for them, but she would tell them where it was, or she would say, you should try this gimmick, you should try this. Her first time seeing Joey Diaz here, who's my favorite comic, she called him, said, you look like a fat baby up there, and would call him fat baby, and would give him spots forever, hosting. Just a great lady. And of course, this was, uh, there was always the Mitzi spot, the Mitzi parking spot. And then in the main room, there's, as soon as you, say you walk in through this entrance, you walk all the way down the hall into the main room, the very first booth to your left was Mitzi's booth. Nobody was ever allowed to sit there, and Mitzi always sat there. And when she would do showcases, she would uh, sit there and just yell from the dark, give them the light, or you're funny. And people would say, people that worked here would be terrified to showcase in front of her because they, they said, you could be a phone guy. She'd see your act one time and tell the, uh, the manager, fire him, he doesn't have it. So, I mean, hey, that's what it takes to be in comedy. You need somebody who's, who, who can scrutinize and has a vision, and Mitzi definitely had a vision for this place, and that's the reason it's the most popular comedy club in the entire world now. Now, if you're interested, go find the Comedy Store podcast because they specialize in basically bringing anybody that's ever performed here into the podcast room downstairs here and then they really grill them. They let them tell the stories about their time here at the Comedy Store, which sometimes are extremely interesting stories. Well, rest in peace, Mitzi. Hopefully the Comedy Store will live on for another 50 years. Now, like I said, this is a comedy club unlike no other, and a lot of people wouldn't find themselves feeling at home here, but that's exactly what makes a lot of other people love it here, is that there are no rules, that anything goes, anything can be tried here, and it's thanks to her seeing that there was a spot in comedy for weird, different, and unique. And before that, 
nothing had been seen like what Mitzi Shore put on the stages here. I mean, if you just think of Sam Kinison, Gallagher, I mean, and this turned into a franchise. There was a Westwood Comedy Store, um, uh, Pacific Beach Comedy Store that eventually turned into La Jolla. There was one in Vegas. There's, I think there's even one now that's not really associated with the Comedy Store, but it's Australia, London. Um, you know, it, it just became a huge deal. And a lot of people say that came from um, in 1972 when Mitzi and Sammy, when they opened this, it was right there at that same time that Johnny Carson moved from New York City and brought The Tonight Show to LA. Then of course they needed Los Angeles comedians and people that had always lived in New York to do comedy started migrating over to Los Angeles and performed here. I may actually give Jimmy Walker quite a bit of credit as well because he was the first homegrown talent out of the comedy store here that Mitzi found that got his own show. And if you look up the hill, there's a sign up there. What that sign says, because that's her property as well, it says Main Room Workshop Belly Room. And that's Crest Hill. That's the house that she owns, or owned. I believe, I'm not sure if they still own it or not, but that's where she let all the comedians live. Since September 11th, 2001, the Comedy Store will close its doors in honor of Miss Mitzi Shore. Rest in peace, Mitzi. Well, good evening, my friends. I just wanted to uh, send a heartfelt condolence out to the Shore family. Thank you to Mitzi Shore for everything you created. The Comedy Store is a place unlike any other in the world. And it's all because of you. I wanted to call it an end of the night. I wanted to thank Marine Cox Brown and Frank Ferrello for becoming my newest Patreons and everyone else. I'll see you all tomorrow. Have a great night. If you've never been to the Comedy Store, I highly recommend you go. It's a place unlike any other place in the world. Goodbye.